while we're while we're doing that um, take note of some of the folks that you see that aren't here and follow up with them just call them tell them you missed them and make sure they're okay Pastor's having a second knee surgery on the 28th, um, and uh, Faye, I believe you're having cataract surgery this week. Is it Wednesday? Wednesday, okay. Um, Barrett and Amber, a young couple that have been uh, been coming, uh, are expecting twins. 
Um, any time. Well, it was any time, I think, two weeks ago. So, um, uh, so we want to continue to pray for them. And um, Gene Pendleton, John's dad, is doing a lot better. Um, so continue to pray for them. And uh, Dorothy uh, Merrick uh, hasn't, uh, hasn't been able to rejoin us yet. Uh, so she's in room 103 at the Highlands uh, behind Walmart. Uh, so if you have an opportunity, stop by and say hello to her. That's, that'll be a good visit, guaranteed. Um, let's um, read our responsive uh, passage, and then, um, and then we'll spend some time in prayer. And I heard a voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and whom will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. Make the heart of this people dull, and their eyes, or, or, I'm sorry, their ears heavy, and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. And the Lord removes people far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. And though it remain in it, it will be burned again, like a terrible or an overhope, whose stump remains when it is stuck. The holy seed is in the sun. Doug, is there any way we can go back to that first uh, verse, verse 8? I want you to notice, that when I was just looking through this, I, I wanted you to notice something. It says, then I said, here am I. And what's after that word I, or that letter I? That didn't come without passion. It didn't come without commitment. It may have come after months of soul searching. I, I mean, years, I don't know. But there was a point here when he was committed. And he didn't just say, um, uh, uh, here's, uh, here am I. <laughs> this is the passion and the commitment that we've been called to. And it's wholehearted. And it's sometimes scary. But this is what we are called to. So throughout this year, my prayer for all of us, me included, is when God says, I need this to happen. We are busting forth to be at the front of the line and say, God, send me. I'm willing. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for, for your word. Just this very simple phrase of here am I. And then our feeble attempts to even understand all the things that have happened before this that brought this exclamation point forth. And I pray that you would continue to work in our hearts. We thank you for the work that you have done. We thank you for the growth through your spirit and through your word. And God, I pray that in this coming year, you won't allow us just to sit back. We, we began studying several years ago about how some people in real life discipleship, some people find themselves kind of in the stands, some people are kind of on the sidelines, and some people are actually on the field. And Father, I pray that we would not allow another year to go by just to be complacent, to not be doing kingdom work, to not be at your bidding. Father, I pray you won't have to, to go and, and get us and drag us in. <laughs> I, I pray you won't have to send a big fish to take us where you want us to go. Father, help us to, to be ready, to be willing, even though th there, it, there's some uncomfortableness with that, because we have to depend on you. And Father, a lot of times in this country, we kind of depend on ourselves more. But I pray you would help us to capture this phrase personally and to look for areas where you want us to serve 
and for us to just simply proclaim, here am I, send me. Father, I thank you for healing that you've brought in the lives of, of many of our congregation. And we pray for the surgeries that are upcoming, cataract surgery and, and knee surgery. We pray for those that are continuing to heal. Father, we thank you that you are a God who is a healing God, that you watch over us and protect us and guide us. Father, I pray that as we continue our worship here, I pray that you will encourage us and that your spirit will inhabit our praise. And we can say not only has it been good to be in the house of the Lord, but Father, it has been impactful so that when we walk out of here, not only will we know more about you, but we will be willing to be sent in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. We're going to continue to worship through song together. And uh, you guys notice that Clifton's not here today, and he is a big part of this <laughs> team and really helps uh, solidify the music. And so you guys can pray for us as we go without him. Um, this, this passage we just read uh, is... It's kind, of, it's kind of what we're going to be centering on in this in the the preached word today, and you know I we've all been in different levels and different levels, different parts of our journey as a Christian, right? And some a lot longer, and and some not so long. But at some point in time, we're all challenged to go, and we're all challenged to send and and be sent, and 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 so these. The songs that we're going to sing today are, are geared specifically towards this passage here that we've just read. And um, either you're a sender or you're a goer. And I can't remember the, who, I'm going to mess this quote up, but I think it was Spurgeon. He said, if you're a believer, if you're a Christian, you're, you're either a missionary or a counterfeit. Am, am I, something like that. And, um, and so even, even here in Owasso, we're to be missionaries to someone. And... Uh, and so these songs, even if you don't have that in your heart, it's aching to get out. I know it is. And so God can use anything. He can use the lyrics of a song, the, the word preached, the, the, the scripture read. And, um, and I think that, that those things washing over us are what the Spirit uses to get us to act <laughs> in some way, whatever that looks like for each of us, to act. And so if you're not there and if I'm not there, then, then we're going to let the word and the, and the music and the preaching wash over us today and pray that the Spirit will use part of that and all of those together to make us act as, as missionaries. So let's sing together. And, and if you don't know these, then just grab a hold of them. They're, they're pretty simple. And, and, uh, and we're just going to sing, prepare to hear from the word preached.
to go around the world like Adam and Tiffany and others that we know but this song speaks to the other side of that we'll go wherever it is if it's in the homes of the broken across the street here or across the street over here um, that's where we go wherever the need is and, and I think that that's part of us just praying God show where I'm supposed to go tells us to be ready like Norman just said to be like yes that's me I'm going there now so Yeah. 
come now and we're going to take up our morning offering and and pray together Heavenly Father I do pray that you would wash over us with your word with your truth today and that you would uh, move in us the Holy Spirit would move in us to act and uh, to find where it is we are to go to find who we are, who it is we're to send. Um, and to know that as we do that, as we go, w- whether it be across the street here um, in a home or, or around the world, that, uh, that we know who's going before us. And um, that we would be comforted that as we're in an uncomfortable position, that you are there And the Holy Spirit gives us the power to do that. It's not on our own strength. And and so, help us to hear the Word and hear, and that hearing the Word of God that will be put into action in our lives. We thank you now for this offering. Thank you for those that give uh, give sacrificially. and, And I pray that you would not only bless them, but bless the offering, multiply it, use it um, in a way that we couldn't even grasp uh, or, or imagine and that you would continue to, to challenge our hearts as a congregation as a people of God to give um, to give sacrificially to give with a cheerful heart and a glad heart um, and that you would use it to advance your word here in Owasso and the surrounding area and, and to the ends of the earth and uh, we pray this in Christ's name amen is always by my 
brief passage before we preach and wrap up this uh, series we've been looking at it corresponds to the to the theme International Mission Board theme I was so taken by it that I thought we need to, we need to track with that during this Christmas season Acts chapter 13, if you'll turn there, please. Acts chapter 13. We will grant that Jesus commissioned the disciples. We're, we're going to cite that verse in John's gospel where he speaks peace to them. and says, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. We grant that. But in the life of the New Testament church, this is the first time that... that Missionaries are sent out. Follow along as I read Acts 13, verses 1 to 3. Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. Very brief passage, but with power. What promise. What progress for the gospel in this. We just read together what? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word of God. This has already been said by Norman and by Josh. I just want to echo it. May the Lord grip us with this attitude. Lord, I'll go where you want me to go. And I'll pray and I'll give so that we can increasingly be a sending church. Thank you. Be seated. an interesting journey these several weeks I've just now really gotten back up on uh, on two feet and I'm fixed to get one hobbled again tomorrow but as I've said to you many times and I'll keep on saying uh, brother Jim Schrod is my he's my point man I watch him and I get encouraged when I see him walking he's ahead of me in this journey and I, great, I draw great encouragement from him. I've gone from coming in in a wheelchair to coming in in a walker to coming in on a cane to walking in unaided. And then God's providence will do it all again. Uh, hopefully we'll cut out the little 10-day uh, side journey this time. And straight home from the hospital and back among you in a timely way, I trust. We've been looking at this theme because of who he is. And there were four things we considered. And Brother Conrad and Bayway became available, he and Felicitas, to come. And so we let them drop in on us. And what wonderful time we had last week with his preaching of the word. And, and so I'm doubling up today. We began looking at because of who he is, we pray. John Bunyan, remember, said, we dare not do anything 
in the name of God until we have prayed. And when we have prayed, we'll do no better thing, no matter what we do, than pray. So we pray. That's where it starts. If, if we don't start with prayer, then, then we, we really could be accused of doing things in the arm of the flesh. And someone said recently uh, that uh, part of the problem in the West is that, that we pray and then we're the answer to our prayers. We, we pray, give us this day our daily bread, and then we go to the grocery store and shop. And we were talking with Conrad and Felicitas when they were in our home. And I think one of my children asked him something about needs. And, and he pointed this out. He said, he said, when our people pray, give us this day our daily bread, they really don't know where it's coming from. We found that as well uh, when we had our Haitian pastor friends in. And Brother Pastor Joseph said to us about Pastor Mimi, when we treated him so well and, and took care of them, he said, you know, he, I reminded him he goes back to a place. He's been here in America where, where you have plenty to eat. He goes back to a place where he will not know where he will get food for his family for the day. So we pray. We ought to be a praying people, and increasingly so. And I'm excited about the leadership that Joe Ramey is giving in our midweek prayer times and the, the study we've been going through on prayer and, and now to begin this Bible study that's mixed with video that's going to be a small group about prayer, prayer warriors, warfare praying. And I really hope and pray you're going to avail yourself to this when we get going, not this Wednesday, but next Wednesday. Hope you'll be there for that. It's going to be a great study. So we pray. But we also looked at how, because of who he is, we give. Uh, he's the giving God. I've, I read a pastor friend of mine tried to make a point this past week on Facebook, and I point was well taken but not well made. He tried to make a distinction between saying that Jesus was not sent, he was given. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Well, I understand what he was trying to say, that Jesus is a gift of God. But the scripture also says that God sent Jesus. We'll look at some of those passages in a few minutes. But we give because our God's the giving God. Giving is his idea. He, he was totally complete and fulfilled in the Trinitarian being that is the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. When I was doing my doctoral studies, we, we had a seminar where we discussed why, uh, why God made man. And a pastor who'd been a pastor for a season of time, who'd, who'd received a master's degree in seminary, was working on the doctorate with us, actually said this. I about fell out of my chair. He said, well, I've always thought, which, by the way, anytime somebody says they've always thought that they haven't, they, that's, that's sort of give you cover for something that just popped in their mind to give it some authority, you know. I've always thought that he made man because he was lonely. Mercy. He was not lonely. He was completely fulfilled. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, in communion, together for all eternity. And he gives. And you can follow through the scripture how he does that. It's because of who he is, we give. Our, our response, the, the, the response that's built into us by the Holy Spirit, giving us the new birth, enabling us to repent and believe in Christ, bringing us from death to life, weaves into us a giving heart. A stingy Christian is a, is a contradiction of terms. So we looked at those two things. Today we turn our thoughts to this. Because of who he is, we send and we go. We send and we go. And we've just read this passage in Acts. It's a brief passage, but uh, it shows us that, doesn't it? It shows us the sending church, the church at Antioch. Sending. It shows us the, the, the willingness to go on the part of Saul. He hadn't even been named Paul at that point. In fact, if you notice, if you read the Acts very carefully, it's Barnabas and Saul, Barnabas and Saul, and then it shifts to Paul and Barnabas, where he, now having been discipled by Barnabas, takes the lead role. So I want us to think just for a few minutes today 
on two things that, and really verse 2 is where we're going to focus. I, I would make the comment on verse 1. Isn't it interesting that you find as one of the believers in the church at Antioch, Manan, who we're told was a lifelong friend of Herod Tetrarch, who was a great enemy of the gospel. So here's a man who was raised as a Jew, came to faith in Christ, finds himself in Antioch, a part of this church. But the two things I want us to see from this passage today, really verse 2, is the divine origin of sending and the divine urging to go. And they have to both be present. Look at the divine origin of sending. Verse 2 says, While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. Now it's important to know that this word missionary we have, Josh quoted Spurgeon a while ago, either, every Christian is either a missionary or a counterfeit. It's from the Latin word missio. And missio simply means sent. So a missionary, in Latin, is a sent one. In that regard, Jesus, the sent one, the one sent by the Father, he, he is the original missionary. God gave him his gift, but he sends him to save sinners. So when we talk about missionary, we're not, let's, let's get away from the official title. Oh, you're a missionary. That means that you're going around the world. Well, it, it could mean that. But the truth of the matter is that all of us are saved to be sent. Just like we are blessed to be a blessing. We are, we are not beaver Christians who, who have the inflow of water and spend our energies damming up the water so it doesn't go anywhere. We, we are to, we to have the life flow through us as we receive the, the living water of the Holy Spirit. The scripture says that out of us will flow living water. Out of us will flow life-giving realities. We're saved to be sent. But notice that the, the idea of sending is not ours. It's not, it's not like the church at Antioch sat down and said, you know, this Christianity is really wonderful and amazing. I think more people need to know about this. In fact, if you, if you study the early church, if you study the upper room in, in Acts chapter 2, you find out that, that they were terrified at the prospect of going anywhere. They were huddled in the upper room hoping the Roman authorities didn't find out where they were so that they wouldn't end up uh, hanging on a cross. Jesus comes to them in Acts chapter 1 and it makes it very plain that, uh, that you're to go. You'll, you'll be my witnesses. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, uttermost parts of the earth. And if you read through the book of Acts, you realize it's, it's into Acts 9 that it's not the missionary imperative that moves the early church into Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. It is the persecution of the early church that does that. I would submit to you parenthetically that if America cannot be moved by the missionary imperative, that we are sure, because we, because we are saved to be sent, we can be sure that persecution will come to, to blow us out of our bunkers. It's God's way. It's His will. We can't escape it. The idea of sending is God's idea. It's interesting that sure, as sure as the Scripture teaches us that God's the original sender, it's fascinating that the first movement of missionary compulsion comes in the context of a worship service. An intense worship service, by the way. They were worshiping, which means they were, they were praising God, they were reading the Word, they were fasting, they had, they had been fasting and they came to this worship service not having eaten, they were still engaged in a fast. 
were not told what they were fasting for. They, but it was not unusual in the early church and, and in the church throughout the centuries to call for a fast to address a particular need, a particular issue. So they're worshiping, they're fasting, they're sensitive to the Lord and to his leadership, and the Lord breaks in by the Holy Spirit and says, set apart for me. Who's it for? Set apart for God. Well, certainly it's for the good of those that they're going to be going to. They're going to, they're going to take the gospel to places that otherwise would not have heard the gospel. But get that, folks. The divine origin, God is the one who sins. Sending is his idea. And we're sent for God. Now that meant a lot to William Carey, who labored seven years before he saw the first convert. Seven years. Fred Narm Judson, who trying to translate the New Testament into the into the language uh, of the people that he was serving among, having all of his writings burned. His wife dies. He marries again. She dies on the mission field. For John Payton who went to preach to the cannibals. And one of the elder statesmen in his church said, you're foolish, young man. You will be eaten by cannibals. Now, how do they know that? Because the last missionaries who had gone to the New Hebrides, as the, as the skiff carried the, the man and his wife to shore and was coming back, and the people on the boat were watching, they watched the cannibals rush out of the jungle, descend upon them, butcher them, and begin to eat them right there. When John Payton arrived at the New Hebrides, his wife ultimately died, but he would have to dig her remains up and move them so the cannibals wouldn't get to them to dig them up and eat them. You see, if you go on mission for people, you won't go. It's amazing some of the things that Christians are saying about Muslims. And I understand the risks, and, and, I'm, and I'm, a, I'm a thoughtful man, and I intend to follow the Sixth Commandment and do all that I can to protect my own life and the life of my family and others. But folks, do you realize that God has shaken the entire Middle East to its core? Lifelong Muslims are running from Muslims. They're fleeing into Europe. They're coming in boats. There's a video out you need to find. It's a Samaritan's person. They're videoing a group of refugees on a, on a makeshift boat coming to shore. And, and the person says, we're the first Christians they're going to see. We're the first Christians they will have met. Pray that we make a good impression on them, a gospel impression. I know that Muslims from the Middle East are backward. They live, they live in the 6th and 7th century in their ways. They're, they're barbarous. Uh, but do you also know, if you're, reading, if you're reading international journals, that there are more Muslims coming to faith in Christ now than at any time in history? You see, if, if you go on mission... For Muslims, you won't go. <laughs> but if you go on mission for God, then you must go. So this, this divine origin has got the Holy Spirit says, set apart for me these two for the work to which I have called them. We read earlier in Isaiah 6, Verse 8 and 9 simply, if you know the background, it's in the first verse of Isaiah 6, Isaiah tells us it was, it was in the year that King Uzziah died. Uzziah was a, was a boyhood friend of Isaiah, and when, when the king died, Isaiah was brokenhearted. 
In the, king, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and, and his train filled the temple, and above him were the cherubim, and, and, they, and they, covered the, they covered their eyes, they covered their extremities, they, they flew with two wings, and they, and they continually cried out in antiphonal voices, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And they were echoing in, the, in that chamber of the temple that Isaiah had this vision, and In the midst of such holiness, he realized his sinfulness. I cried out, woe is me, for I am undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. I live in a culture, in a foul, vile culture. And one of the angels was sent by the Lord to take and with a tong, take a coal from off the altar, a burning coal, and touch it to Isaiah's lips and said, this has cleansed you. This altar of sacrifice cleanses you. Isaiah says, I heard this voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And Isaiah, as, as Norman pointed out, just compassion said, Here am I. Send me. In other words, how can someone who's who has become aware of his own sin and knows his sin has been cleansed. You cannot be silent. John says it this way in 1 John chapter 4, verse 10, and this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. He sent the Son, Jesus, was by the Father. Jesus said this to his disciples. I referenced it a while ago. John 20, 21. He said to them, again, peace be with you. And peace is not the absence of turmoil. Peace is the confidence that whatever the circumstances, you are reconciled to God and everything is going to be okay. Peace be to you. As the Father sent me, even so I am sending you. He the sent one sins. But there's a second thing in this verse, the divine urging to go. The same verse. They were worshiping the Lord, and the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And you see implied there, to which I have called them to go. You know, it's useless for there to be an urgency to send if there's not a willingness to go. I was visiting with the young man. I'll speak very carefully here in case this is broadcast. The young man who he and his wife and family have returned to this region for a few weeks was visiting with him at breakfast, talked about the people group that they are going to engage. And he said 99.95% of this people group, they could be number 5 million across all the islands where they're going in Southeast Asia, 1 million in the city where they'll be going. 99.95% of this people group is Muslim. That means 0.05%, half of 1% is everything else. And somewhere in there is a small little fragment, maybe, of evangelical Christian. There's got to be a going We've discovered in recent years as American missiology has been overtaken by biblical missiology that there is no closed country to the gospel. <laughs> we used to use that language, you know, well, we can't go there, they're closed. They won't allow the gospel in. And then God raised up a generation that read the scriptures and realized God didn't call us to go to safe places necessarily. You hear a lot of talk, it just, it, I, 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 honestly, I, I bounce between being humored and being angered in this whole safe place chatter that's going on today. 
We've got to have safe places in college campuses. There's got to be a place that an 18 to 22 year old can run to and feel safe where somebody's not going to say something that hurts his or her feelings. I agree with the president of the Wesleyan College in Bartlesville. If you want to be safe, stay home. God didn't call it to safe Christianity. We're discovering that more and more. We live in interesting times. Pastors, young pastors being raised up by God are awakening to the reality that from heaven's vantage point, it is not a church's seeding capacity that is important, but a church's sending capacity. Now make no mistake about it, I would love I pray and, and, I, and I've talked to people. I would love to see every place on every pew taken by someone sitting here. I, I long for that. I pray for that. I ache for that. I will die with that as my desire and my dream. But that's not enough. It's not our seating capacity, it's our sending capacity. Who will go? Josh has already said it. I don't believe for a minute that God has called every one of us in this place to, to leave our homes and go to the ends of the earth. But I do believe if he saved us, he's called us to go. It could be across the fence. The apartment complex. Broken lives, shattered dreams. Perhaps north of our facility up into Ator Heights. To go, to engage. Perhaps south of the facility in the neighborhood. Perhaps in your neighborhood. Do we see our neighborhoods as mission fields? I love it when I hear some of you talk about your neighbors and, and you call them by name and you know who they are. I think that's awesome. Do we pray for them? Do we pray, Lord, may the peace of Jesus Christ be on that house and that home. And if I'm not sure about it, help me know how to engage them. This is a great, you know, you can get away with a lot during this time of the year. You can take cookies to anybody this time of the year. And they don't suspect anything. Now you show up in January, February, March with cookies, they wonder what's going on. But this time of year, you can take anybody cookies. They just associate it with the season. And you can connect. It's not too late. It's still December. And just, just bless. Just be a blessing. Look for ways to bless our neighbors. Look for ways to get to know them so that we can pray intelligently with them. Look, look for ways to serve our neighbors. That may be your mission field. We know this much. God didn't. God, none of us lives where we live by accident. Paul teaches in Acts 17, he has set the bounds of our habitation. <laughs> uh, Bill Askell, a loose paraphrase of that is, he's put us in the houses we live in. The apartments we live in. On purpose. Are we going? Are we willing to go? I mean, it starts with a willingness. We don't just do something to say we've done it. We, we start with, well, I've heard, I've heard your call. Here am I. Send me. It may be for some here, getting out of your comfort zone and, and spending a week to ten days among our Haitian brothers and sisters, being very uncomfortable and yet very blessed. It may be we'll make plans to 
go to see this young couple, this family that's about to spend nine weeks in debriefing with the International Mission Board and then one year in language school overseas and then from there into the people group where the Lord is calling them. Maybe you want to make a trip over there and just go over there. And wouldn't you think that someone who's left uh, the comfort and the safety and the security of, if you, of their homeland would be thrilled to see people when they're, when they're at a place that 99.95% of the population belongs to a religion sworn to kill you I think they would love to see some faces <laughs> be a great encouragement to see where would you have me go, Lord? That's, I, I, I've got to know that. How do I know that? By praying. How do I, how do I intensify my commitment to that? By giving. It's, it's the old, old adage, we put our money where our mouth is. We're interested in that which we have, in, have invested in. How will I keep it before me that we, we continue to sin? I love, I love the Haiti collective connection we have because it's a hop, skip, and a jump from where we live by air. And it's continually before us so that we don't forget the importance of sending. We remind it continually. That more than a collecting church, we're a sending church. We're, we're experiencing the rivers of water of the living Holy Spirit that we might have flowing from us, rivers of water. And, and as we keep that awareness high and intense, it changes the way we see people we engage here. It should. Because it's not just those people way out there on the ends of the earth that need the gospel. America, the United States of America, I think this number's right. It's either the third or the fourth largest mission field on the planet. Wait a minute. We live in the good old USA. <laughs> yeah, we do. Arguably, from many angles, the greatest nation on the face of the earth. And yet, if this greatest nation on the face of the earth, I'm from Beaumont, Texas, and it's nothing to brag about. I mean, it's just it's a it's a great place to be from. Uh, and I read an article yesterday. The city manager and the city attorney in Beaumont, Texas, Southeast Texas, decided that policemen. The police force, members of the police force, on their lunch breaks, engaging in a, in a it's not, wasn't even every week, uh, voluntary Bible study was against policy. And they had to stop that. I'm not talking about San Francisco, California. <laughs> I'm talking about Beaumont, Texas, where I grew up. One of those proverbial buckles of the Bible belt, you know. And you'll read that over and over and over again across our land. There's a mission field here. Do you know that there are people in Wausau who've never had anyone tell them the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ? And yet, there's a new, put this in quotes, church springing up almost every week in this city. But you know what many of the churches are doing? Just playing musical chairs. Something new pops up. Folks that are dissatisfied with the old, go over to the new. 
play musical chairs. We're shuffling chairs on the deck of the Titanic while it's sinking. You see, you don't have to go to Bulgaria, Indonesia, fill in the blank, to be a missionary. We'll stand to our feet in a couple of moments and we'll sing and we'll walk out of here. And if we will wrap our minds around because of who he is, we will walk into cold weather missionaries. Now long before I got here, there were signs posted at the exits, entrances. It said you are now entering the mission field. It's always been true. My prayer, as we bring to a close 2015 and approach 2016, is that there will be burned into us an ever-intensifying urgency to be a sending church. And that this urgency to sin will be accompanied by a growing willingness on the part of every one of us because we, we all need to be, we all need one another in this. Every one of us to respond to God's call upon our lives with here am I, send me. Whether that means for you across the street, across the fence, down the road, in your own neighborhoods, across this region, to the Tulsa metro area, the state, the country, or the ends of the earth. You see, it doesn't matter where the Lord sends us. What matters is, our, do we have the heart that says, hear my Lord, send me. If we are willing to go, then he will make his marching orders clear to us. And if we're not willing to go, then I think, I think a confusion attends that, a lack of clarity. So, you see, the devil's lie is, well, wait until you get clarity before you're willing. That's not the Lord's way. The Lord's way says, be willing. Go back and read Isaiah again. Here am I, send me. Did you read his mission he was going on? He said, okay, Isaiah, go and tell this people and they won't hear a thing you say. In fact, your message to them is going to be, you have dull ears and hard hearts. God's word is, is offensive to you. That was, his, that was the sermon series he was to preach to these people God was sending him. I love what Isaiah does, though. He didn't say, well, now, <laughs> I, I want to go somewhere where it's fruitful, Lord. I love what he says. For how long, Lord? For how long? And the Lord gives him an answer. Until what you see before you is utter devastation. We need to pray for revival here in Owasso in America. But we need to prepare, brothers and sisters, we need to prepare for an economic national, religious holocaust that may well bring utter devastation. And so don't fall into the devil's trap saying, well, when you get clarity, then you can commit. Because God's way is commit and I will give you clarity. That's my challenge to me today. It's my challenge to you as we leave 2015. Prepare to enter into 2016. Commit. Here am I. I'll go where you want me to go, dear Lord. I'll say what you want me to say. I'll be who you want me to be. That's the challenge, it seems to me. Because of who he is. 
We pray. We give. We sin. And we do not go now. We pray. We give. We sin. We go. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we confess there are things in your word that are, that are really uh, hard to figure out. But this is not one of them. <laughs> this is abundantly clear. And we want to be a people who by committing to you anew and afresh... In considering who you are, what your character is, who you are and what you have done, what your promises are, in considering all those wonderful things, that we come to new and fresh levels of commitment. And trust in that, that as we say prayerfully, Generously, with a missional mindset to sin, we say, Here am I, Lord, send me. Here we are, Lord, send us. And I pray that in the days, weeks, months ahead, 2016, will be a year perhaps unlike any where we go. We go. We go across the street. We go down the road. We go across the fence. We, we go up and down the streets of our neighborhood. We go into the homes of our neighbors. We, we go. We invite them into our home. We are, we are goers because we know that the sending God has sent us. Here we are, Lord. Send us. For Jesus' sake, amen. Let's stand together and sing as we prepare to dismiss. that in Psalm 2. And he gives us that same promise. He said, when the Holy Spirit comes, you will see greater things than you've seen being with me. They did on Pentecost. And the church has been seeing greater things ever since. Our brothers and sisters, this will be a year when you will see God do great and mighty things 
in your life, in your home, through your witness, that you never imagined before. Pray the Lord will bless you and keep you this week. Stay safe. Uh, my, my plan, if it's God's plan, is uh, I won't be with you next week uh, or the week after. Possibly. Possibly the 17th. Hopefully, prayerfully, uh, the 24th. But I want to get back as quick as I can. So I appreciate your prayers for me as we pray for one another entering the new year. Let's bow together. Joshua, would you lead us preach as we go? Heavenly Father, thank you for this word today. And I do pray that you would uh, take it and the Spirit would prompt us to act on it. That uh, this next year that we would um, we would look back at the end of 2016 and see that, uh, that that was the year that uh, Bethel was on on the move. That was that Bethel was was a going church, an ascending church. I thank you that you've taught us all of these truths, and that that um, you've blessed us with your truth and. And so I pray now that we would just have the, the courage and the willingness to commit. And then having committed, that you would make it clear as a congregation and as individually where you would have us to go. And uh, help us to love one another, to encourage one another, and to edify one another, and, and, and lift one another up, and uh, love one another as a family. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen.